Today, we're hearing from Francis Rodolosa, who's head of fixed income ETFs at Van Eck. Now, one of the funds in his lineup, the Van Eck High Yield Fallen Angel Bond Fund, has done better than most other high yield funds over the past decade, and it's done way better than investment grade bond funds, funds by just high quality credits. So he's gonna explain how this works. It tracks an index, and Fran is gonna tell us how that index works. One caveat, uh, what we're doing today is educational. Neither one of us is giving investment advice. We're just explaining this index of fallen angel bonds. So let's start even before we get to fallen angels with the word high yield. Does that mean the same thing as junk? Um, yes. Uh, hey, Bill, and thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, a lot of people use the term uh, junk bond uh, to signify uh, bonds that are rated below investment grade. So it's called the high yield universe, the sub investment grade universe, the speculative grade universe, or, or junk bonds. Uh, uh, they're all interchangeable terms. All right, good, good enough, good enough. Now let's define the division line between junk and investment grade. BBB minus is that the cutoff point? Explain how that works. Sure. So the bond ratings agencies they all have slightly well different. A couple of them have different scales. Moody, Moody's and Standard and Poor's, for instance, use uh, different uh, designations. But for we use the Standard and Poor's designation. Yes, triple B minus is the lowest level of what is considered investment grade, while one ratings notch lower, double B plus is considered the highest notch of uh, high yield or, or speculative grade debt. So uh, maybe not a big gap between the uh, debt fundamentals of a triple B minus rated issuer and a double B plus rated issuer, but they're in very different investment universes. I see. Now, to find fallen angel, that's a subset of the lower grade stuff. Correct. Uh, and a fallen angel bond is a bond that was originally rated at issue uh, triple B minus or higher. So it was an investment grade bond when it was issued uh, and it was subsequently downgraded to double B plus or lower. So it's a original issue investment grade bond that's now rated high yield. That's the definition of a, of a fallen angel. What, what was that line from Mae West? I used to be good, but then I drifted. Yeah. All right. Something along those lines. So, so give me some examples. What are some companies that are in that index? Uh, well, some of the uh, largest uh, issuer weights in the index today include uh, Ford, uh, which you've probably heard of, Occidental Petroleum, uh, Sprint, Las Vegas Sands. There's some other well-known companies that are smaller weights, but still meaningful. Delta Airlines, Nordstrom, uh, Royal Caribbean, Macy's. Wow. Familiar names, but they're just not quite up to par. They got too much debt. All right. So um, what what happens when these fawns, when, when these angels fall? They're kind of in purgatory. Do they keep paying their bills? Are, they, are you getting the coupons paid to you? Yeah, there are a couple of dynamics here, by the way. Just by the way, in, in price terms, what happens uh, in the six to 12 months leading up to that downgrade to the high yield universe they tend to lose uh, a lot of value in price. On average, about eight points over the history of the Fallen Angel Index, eight points in price loss in the six months leading up to the downgrade that puts them to the high yield universe. Interestingly, they tend to recover uh, about 90% of that loss in the ensuing six months. And that's because they mostly do keep paying. Most Fallen Angels stay in a double B uh, category. The vast majority do end up maturing um, about on average, roughly 5% annually get re-rated back to investment grade. Uh, and on average, a little less than 2% do uh, eventually uh, default on an annual basis. I see. Good and bad. You got to take the good, the bad with the good. Well, all right. But these are mostly pretty good businesses, even if the, you know, the balance sheets don't look so good. So Ford, it's a good company. People like the cars, right? Royal Caribbean, people are still taking cruises. So the problem, if I understand you right, is is that you have a good business with a little too much debt. Is that a good way of describing what's going on here? It, it could be, um, for sure. There are a variety of reasons why these companies lose their investment grade rating. Uh, and as you say, it, it may be they, they hit a snag and, and, and you know, at the margin, uh, their debt dynamics 
put them more in the in the double B category, uh, for, you know, for, from the ratings agency's point of view. But it may be because a company uh, made acquisition, so M and A, which it funded with debt, so it's just changed the company's debt dynamics, uh, and management may be well aware that they're at risk of losing their investment grade rating, and it's a conscientious. Uh, decision to, to gear up and, and make acquisitions. In other cases, it could be, you know, a loss of market share because it becomes a very competitive environment. They might be an industry like the like the oil industry where, um, you know, a, a steep drop in energy prices can change the debt dynamics for, you know, E&P companies or oil services companies pretty quickly. That happened in 2015 and 2016 for, for certain. There were a lot of downgrades in, in that sector then and again in, in 2020. So there are a variety of reasons, um, but as you suggest, a lot of these companies are still able to service their debt. They just are, as per the ratings agency's calculations, now at a higher probability or possibility of default over over the long term, and that what that's what moves you in a speculative grade debt category. But you know, the companies that are near term very high risk of default usually you'll see rated triple C or, you know, triple C plus, maybe a lower B minus, you know, today, 80%, 87% of the fallen angel index is actually still rated in the broad double B category. So these, these are not terrible businesses. I mean, I guess I can see something like Macy's, maybe they're losing traffic to Amazon and Royal Caribbean. Maybe people won't take as many cruises as they used to, but I see a lot of companies that just look like good businesses. Ford is one of them. And, and I think Under Armour, uh, you know, the sportswear company would be one of them. And it's just a question of having uh, too much debt on top of a pretty good operating business. And uh, is this a good enough analogy? It's kind of like I own a really nice home in a really nice neighborhood, but my mortgage is way too high. So my mortgage might be downgraded, even though there's nothing wrong with my house, right? It's kind of like that. Yep. You still may have more, more, um, you know, equity than than debt, or you still may be able to service uh, that mortgage, even if it's if it's uh, extremely large. Uh, or you may maybe you put an addition on your house and took out a uh, well, that's not uh, an extra line right? of credit. Yeah, you an addition on your house. Okay, yeah. so it's worth more, maybe, maybe, maybe correct. Yeah. Or maybe the same thing with companies. Maybe the acquisition worked. Maybe it didn't work. All right. So here's something that I've always wondered about. Do, do these fallen angels ever get out of purgatory either or get back up to heaven? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I alluded to it earlier, about 5% on average per year, um, something roughly around 40% cumulatively over time of fallen angel bonds have actually reascended to investment grade. A lot of these companies, having been investment grade borrowers, have a lot of incentives to get back uh, to investment grade status. They're typically not sort of high growth companies with, you know, who would consider their cost of equity capital super high. And, and so they don't mind paying high yields on their debt. These are companies that are more established, as you suggested, like well-known large asset bases, but sometimes, you know, lower growth. So a high cost of debt capital is not really in their, in their long-term financing plan. So uh, they tend to work hard. And a lot of the new fallen angels we saw during COVID in 2020, have been working extremely hard. You know, Occidental Petroleum has been aggressively uh, doing liability management to get uh, their overall debt levels to a level that would satisfy the ratings agencies and re-earn them that investment grade rating. So about 5% a year actually get out of purgatory. Okay, so we've had some happy stories. Um, one of them I think you have mentioned to me in the past is EQT, what's that? Um, so, um, that is a, basically a gas, uh, fracking company that was a, you know, a, a, it was acquired, um, I think roughly around 2017. So that was sort of a levered, uh, transaction. It was fairly well run, uh, but was, was geared up a little high. The family that had sold the company to the acquirer had managed the company better than the acquirer. They actually came back in, uh, to, to manage the company again after it had struggled. Um, so it got downgraded from investment grade to high yield in early 2020, right before COVID in February of 2020. Actually, it was one of the better fallen angel stories we've seen it, it within two years and a month, basically March of, uh, 2022, it regained its triple B rating and was really the best 
performer in the index over that two year and one month period. Now you gotta tell me one sad story. There must have been at least one bond that got downgraded, one company got downgraded, and then it got downgraded some more, and then some more, and ouch. Okay, tell me about it. Oh yeah, and and, and more than one, as I mentioned, about a little less than two percent uh annual default rate uh for this index. 2022 happened to be a year where there were not defaults, but we'll go back uh, another couple of years, 2020, uh, a company that we launched the fund uh, that, that we manage in 2012, and uh, one of the bond issuers we bought at that time was JCPenney. Uh, in fact, there were seven JCPenney bonds, I believe, in the index at, at that time, and in April of 2012 when we launched this index. They'd been downgraded uh, to high yield a few years been thinking about three years earlier. Um, actually, four of these bonds did mature uh, over time, uh, but JCPenney over, over several years leading up to 2020 was in pretty steep decline. I mean, uh, you know, getting beaten up pretty badly by online retailers. Um, even before COVID, foot traffic to malls was plummeting, and then COVID was sort of the last, uh, the last straw. So uh, the last uh, several uh, JCPenney bonds that remained in the index uh, did end up defaulting. And, and that was a, a quote unquote, un, unhappy story. Going now to uh, cast our view over the next decade, you can't make an exact prediction, but you can at least talk about what the issues are. What is the bond market assuming would be the inflation rate over the next decade? I haven't looked at... Um... As one measure of the bond market, we're just looking at where nominal, you know, ten-year treasuries yeah, are. Say, first on the nominal. All right, so so treasuries, thirty-year treasuries, they're now yielding rough numbers, four percent, right? Um, well, uh, yeah, or ten-year. Just about ten-year. We'll say ten-year treasuries are yielding roughly three and a half percent, which is, um, you know, I think probably two percent, roughly close to two percent or less above uh, where tips are trading. So when you talk about break evens, yeah. it tells you the market's assuming uh, roughly inflation is going to come back down around that 2% level over the well, long time. Italianas was what I would call those bondholders. We got to explain, by the way, what tips are. So tips are these inflation protected bonds. And Correct. if you buy a tips, which now yields a percentage point and a half or something like that, you're guaranteed to get that in terms of purchasing power. Guaranteed. And if that's uh, two and a half points or two points less than the plain old old style treasury bond. The market seems to be thinking, okay, inflation over the next decade, it's going to be not too bad, two and a half, two percent, yeah. something like that. Well, what happens if the market is wrong? And sometimes everybody in the market is wrong. What happens if inflation over the next decade isn't two and a half? It's double. It's five percent. What's going to happen to my treasuries? What's going to happen to the bond market? Yeah, I mean, they're going to probably need to to readjust. Um, you know, the, the market seems to be, as you suggested, pretty optimistic about inflation coming down even over the next one to two years. Uh, that's why one of the reasons why we have an inverted yield curve, why, you know, short rates are significantly higher than than 10 year yields. Uh, so you would probably see uh, we'd call these, you know, maybe another round of uh, inflation shocks for for the bond market you'd probably see yields move back out at least to that four to five percent range on on 10-year treasuries um you know over the long run as an investor you'd want to earn a positive real yield you'd want to earn some margin above inflation uh for owning longer dated you know government bonds and and so you would probably see some adjustment now if that happened over time uh, you might be earning enough interest to absorb some of the price loss uh, that would that would occur. Um, the higher interest uh, earning the asset as you own, the more cushion you have. So that's why corporate bonds, even investment grade, and then down the high yield, uh, you know, offer more protection against rising yields than treasuries, because they have higher you know higher yields. They have higher current income. Uh, than treasuries. They also tend to be, well, shorter um, you know, maturities, which means lower sensitivity to interest rates than at least owning you know, 30-year treasury bonds. All right. So what's the yield right now today on that index that your fund is tracking? Uh, the Fallen Angel Index is yielding 
around a little over 6.8 percent today on a yield to worse which is uh in a bit from where it started the year uh as you know the whole treasury curve has shifted down uh and the compensation for high yield the spread has has come in a little bit uh as well since the beginning of the year all right but at least at 6.8 percent i could get nicked occasionally a little bit for these defaults that happen the next jc penny and i could suffer inflation which might be two or three, or it might be worse than that, and I might still wind up with a positive return. That's the case then for high yield today. Yeah, the, the case for high yield is exactly that. You're, you're getting you're, you're below long term historical yields, but but in the neighborhood. Um, so when you you know for for me the term is really what this very rough year for fixed income was also an important year in terms of interest rate normalization, where you're getting paid. Uh, better you know better better compensation for taking various types of risk you take when you own bonds and to be earning you know close to seven percent it's getting you closer in line with the historic i think the 20-year average yield on this index is around 7.13 percent actually and we're well well above where we're yielding on average the last 10 years but that was really in a zero interest policy interest rate environment so uh but yeah that that carry that current income is always the most important component of returns on bonds over the long term. Thanks an awful lot, Fran. It's been very uh, elucidating, this, this conversation about a specialized subset of the high yield market. Thanks, Bill. I really enjoyed it.